Hi, so my name is Nathan Main, and I'm going to talk to you today about pushing the limits of the unified model. So you would have already probably seen the talk from a collaborator and sort of member of our group, Ian Bootle, who's described the unified model itself as the current Met Office um, climate and weather prediction model. And later on, you'll hear more from another member of the group, Denis Sergeyev, talking about um, convection resolving simulations. Beauty of doing a recorded talk is that I can leave this slide about collaborators for you to uh, pause and read through later. But just to highlight a few key people, obviously Ian Bootle and James Manners, um, who are collaborators in the Met Office, um, and, and Eric Hebrard and Hugo Lambert, who I work closely with at the University of Exeter. The team is, is there as well, and, and more recently we've had a, a few new recruits, and you can find everything you need at the, the website. Okay, so... The project really uh, that we have at Exeter is working, as I say, closely with the, the Met Office to adapt um, the climate model to uh, model any planet, really, any terrestrial planet or gas giant planet. Today I'm going to very briefly just talk about the interaction for just a minute, and then I'm going to focus on some of the work we've done on, on gas giant planets. Here's a list again. You can pause this and see the type of activities that have either happened and been published or are ongoing at the moment. The ones in white on the left um, will have been talked about by Ian and, and Dennis, as I mentioned, and then I'll talk about the work on the right, about the dynamics and, and also, if I get time, the inflation of hot Jupiter's work done with Pascal Tremblon and, and Felix Sainsbury-Martinez. So what we've got at Exeter and what I've remained committed to for many years is keeping pace with the Met Office. So all of our developments and adaptations are, are put back into a shared repository that the Met Office owns and runs. And that means we have to keep pace with the upgrades, which is tricky, but also means that we've been able to help in terms of sort of shaking out bugs and increasing flexibility and robustness of, of the model and performing, performing kind of idealized process testing. Socrates is the rated transfer part of the UM, and uh, Ian mentioned Jules, the land surface model. And importantly, there's configurations which are also standardized in, in a, using something called ROWS. Now, Socrates itself was, was heavily adapted by James, myself, and David Amundsen. Um, and, and that's an open source code which is used now in, in other GCMs too. So what we're going to talk about is, is, is pushing the limits of the UM into the regime of gas giant planets and particularly nasty ones, hot Jupiters. Um, there's a little schematic on the left which probably is the wrong workshop to have something like that in. But just to highlight, these are the steps through the GCM in very sort of simplistic terms. And the choice we've made is to use the same code Socrates to create our heating rates inside our code but also to create the synthetic observables. We have like a second diagnostic call with much higher wavelength resolution. So it has some advantages, some disadvantages compared to say maybe post-processing, but that's the approach we've, we've done to keep connection with observations. So hot Jupiters, these things have a Rosby number of about one. They're, they're assumed to be tidally locked. They're, they're hydrogen helium dominated, sort of Jovian planets orbiting very close to their central star. Now, most of the observations we have here, of course, are sort of, in a sense, a kind of 1D observation. You either have emission from an entire hemisphere, collapse down, or you get transmission through the limb of a planet. You're collapsing all that spatial variation down into sort of a single data point, really, as a function of, or for a given wavelength. Phase curves do a little bit better. We get sort of information as a function of phase as the planet moves around and you look at the emission. The key point is to interpret these observations is to understand these are dynamical 3D objects and there's no zonal symmetry here. You can't zonally um, uh, uh, sort of uh, mean things and, and everything goes away, although you still can gain a lot of insight by doing that. So what I'm going to do today is talk mainly about the dynamics. I'll leave things like the clouds and chemistry that we've put in. Exciting stuff you can go and look at in the papers, but there's no time to talk about that today. The dynamics itself, um, I'll start sort of at the beginning, many years ago, the UM is capable of stepping through the sophistication in the dynamical equations from the primitive, where you have hydrostasis, thin atmosphere, things like this, uh, all the way up to what's close to being the full uh, fully compressible Euler equations and rotating reference frame. Thor can do this too, I believe, and Russell will talk about that later. So what, um, uh, what we did is, is to, to follow the late pioneering and, and amazing Adam Showman, um, and sort of uh, copy his results in a say, or reproduce his results uh, only about five years later. They did uh, Jonathan Lander in 2009, and we got there in, in 2016. And here's a simulation with full rate of transfer uh, with a, a chemical equilibrium uh, treatment of a hot Jupiter. We have the south to north pole, latitude on the bottom, pressure on the right. You'll notice many orders of magnitude in pressure here, going from several hundred bar to millibar. 
what we have is a big red super rotating jet in the center here. And you can see that the different slices at low pressure, you get an imprint of the forcing, very strong forcing at low pressures, hot red day side and a, a blue cold night side. And then deeper we have this homogenization. And what you see in these hot Jupiters, uh, as Adam first predicted actually, uh, with Tristan Gyo, is that you get a sort of offset in the thermal emission. And this is, is really been understood very completely now by work of uh, Adam and, and Lorenzo Polvani, Florin de Brand and Shami um, Insai. I've really put a, a, a and Raymond Pierre Humbert and, and um, Mark Hammond have really put a very coherent uh, description now together of how this forms. And this is, is driven by eddies and perturbations, the atmosphere which set up this shifted temperature structure, sort of an extension of the um, Matsuno Gill problem. And this has been observed in, in many hot Jupiters. There's one with an exception where the thermal goes in the opposite direction, it's shifted on the other side, but most of them reproduce this effect. Okay, so the work that I did in particular in the early days was to look at the equations of motion here. Uh, everyone has a different form they use. This is just a material derivative for the zonal component here, U. We have the metric terms, V is meridional velocity and W is vertical. Then we have the Coriolis terms and some nasty pressure gradient looking thing. Now, for the four equations, you can see we have these terms here, and then we drop them when we go to the primitive, and of course we, we go from a sort of varying radial coordinate to a fixed planetary radius. So naively, um, I assumed, well, this atmosphere is really thick, there's lots of uh, a very, very big range of pressure, so surely there'll be some effect from the, the deeper equations. And what you see here is very little effect, actually. So after many CPU hours burnt away, uh, we get these zonal wind plots back in 2014, which things look pretty similar. Now, there are some differences, uh, sort of thinner and faster jet as you move to the full equations, but really nothing that would excite an observer here. There isn't going to be a huge difference, um, uh, consequently, on the observations. So that was a disappointment, but on reflection, um, fairly obvious in the sense that although the atmosphere is deep, the radius of the planet below your inner boundary, um, the bit you don't model, that's huge. Uh, you know, Earth is 6,000 kilometers of, of rock with 100 kilometers of atmosphere on top. Here, you've got a, a radius to sort of atmospheric height, a modeled atmospheric height ratio of about 0.1. So that pushed us to look with Florian de Bras um, at cases where perhaps we could, we could test this a bit more and push the limits even more. And we know that warm Neptunes, these sort of potentially hydrogen helium dominated extended atmospheric planets are gonna be very important with tests and as we push down um, the mass that we can detect in the radii. Now here we're starting to see atmospheres that are extended that could well be up to 20% of the ratio between the atmosphere and the uh, and the sort of in the bit below the inner boundary. So with Florian we looked at the equations and it's very simple to see where the sort of terms balance against each other if you want to get rid of the, the sort of uh, the, these vertical component terms in the metric you really need this vertical uh, velocity to be much lower than the meridional velocity times by the tan of the co-latitude. So using some equations and some derivation, in the, and you can see in the paper, alongside some assumptions based on our simulations, we have some predictions of, this, of, the, of when this might break down, and warm Neptunes sit right in that, uh, right in, in that uh, parameter space. So we perform some simulations, and here we have the results. Same again, the same code being used, just with different parameters and different... Um, equation sets to model a warm Neptune. And we have the zonal jet here with the primitive equations on the left and the full. And you can see it's markedly different, both qualitatively and quantitatively. Now this starts to go away a little bit as you spin up, as you rotate the planet faster, and this V time thigh becomes stronger. And actually, as we expect, if you increase the radius below your inner boundary, so it sort of becomes a kind of pseudo hot Jupiter, then this effect completely goes away again. And the simulations here are based on, I think it's 1214b. Um, but any sort of, any warm Neptune will do, or, or, or sort of ex super extended atmosphere. So really what that means is we need to be careful about assumptions we make using, uh, or, or what might be sort of Earth valid assumptions and how they translate into other spheres. Now obviously most GCMs used are adapted from Earth's climate science and, and Thor is it is a completely new one, but still we base a lot of our understanding on, on understanding from Earth's climate. Now push that a little bit further and talk a little bit about radius inflation just for the last minute. A lot of these hot Jupiters have radii much larger than we expect. Basically Coulomb pressure and electron degeneracy suggest that the mass radius relation for Jupiter sized objects just sort of flatten off. They should all be the same radius. In fact, many of these are much larger than that, up to a factor two. 
Um, and it's, it seems to sort of correlate with irradiation. There's been various and are various explanations that, that are still not completely ruled out. Tidal forces, magnetic interactions, things like omic dissipation. But circulation was again put forward by, um, by Adam and Tristan back in 2002. Really seminal work they did there. And what it relies on is, is getting some of that irradiation energy and pushing it down into the atmosphere. And here's some temperature pressure profiles of, of, of the sort of night middle and, and sort of day side and really what you need is the radiation sort of penetrates to about 10 bar you need to drive this stuff down in here and really we don't have a good constraint for the temperature pressure profiles down here at the moment so what we did is we noticed in 2016 that some of our simulations were evolving in the deep atmosphere from the initial condition um, and they were sort of heating up and it was slowly driving down you can see this is temperature pressure here at different longitude points and it was driving across. So Pascal Tremblant really did some excellent work where we used the 3D simulations to create a kind of boundary condition of where the flow was coming from and then rerun that in a steady state 2D code ATMO to really get where we, we needed to be, where the UM couldn't get by marching through time. And really what you get is this, this hotter profile here. So this is the, the standard uh, sort of what you might think of as an 80 bat below. And what we found is that dynamical flow was actually shifting the deeper atmosphere to a hotter adiabat. Now you assume that connects to the convective anterior, so you've increased the, the temperature, connects onto the convection below, mixed all throughout the planet, and then you have a much larger planet. This mechanism is um, very interesting, and Felix Sainsbury Martinez published some work with Dynamical on this, where we run very long timescale simulations. And with the UM, we, we weren't able to quite get quite match Dynamico's elapsed time, but we, we could see the same evolution using full rate of transfer, uh, and we could see this evolution to a hotter and hotter inner boundary, and it's really driven by the advection pushing high uh, potential temperature material deep into the atmosphere, and these are sort of uh, uh, meridional mass flux uh, flows. It shows you this material being really pushed down into the, the, in the interior, but the problem here is we still have a solid uh, sort of single temperature in a boundary, which um, I'm actually working at the moment over the next couple of years to try to fix. We're trying to do much larger scale co computation using the next generation code called Elfric and trying to combine this with a convective interior model to see how this, this sort of interacts. Okay, we'll leave it there and thanks very much for your time.